So to start off with um, governing body roles and responsibilities, um, the Academy Trust is the legal body responsible for the Academy. And the Academy um, Trust's Articles of Association will determine the governance arrangements in the Academy. The, up to now, governance arrangements are determined by education law. So um, the Articles of Association will, will decide and define the number of governors and the method of their appointment, and importantly, the method of their removal. Um, and then the Academy Trust delegates powers and duties to the governing body. And the governing body's responsibilities are probably recognisable as the governing body responsibilities which uh, those articles already governors are, 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 are undertaking. Um, they're contained in the, generally contained in the funding agreement which will be signed with the Secretary of State and include standards and the governing body is uh, responsible for ensuring that the quality of provision remains um, or moves to where it should be or remains high. Um, and the governing body is responsible for a host of compliance issues, some of which some governing bodies are already responsible for, um, obviously delegating much of it to the head teacher, but there are going to be for those community schools who move towards employing staff and holding land, there will be additional responsibilities that they need to make sure are carried out. Um, Academy governors will be uh, responsible for the uh, admissions code, the draft is about to Become reality, and uh, I think some of us were pleasantly surprised that there was more radical changes than, than we thought. And at the other end of the spectrum, again, governing bodies are responsible for um, the whole exclusions process and that the same rules apply for academies as they do for community schools. And collaboration is a requirement. So that's what happens within the system. But then we actually also need to consider to whom academies are accountable. And they are actually accountable to the Secretary of State. And there are people here who are still sort of like not, not, not here in the room, but there are people around who are still not quite clear about this, that actually the Secretary of State at the moment has a lot of schools that he's responsible for. Um, they are exempt charities. That means that they are subject to the full scrutiny of the Charity Commission not subject to the full scrutiny of the Charity Commission, but they are subject to a principal regulator, who is the Secretary of State. <coughs> um, the Secretary of State, therefore, has the power to revoke the funding agreement which has been signed between the Academy Trust and the Secretary of State. There are, within all of this, different models of academies. And I think we're all uh, comfortable and understand the Sponsor Academy model and the Converter Academy model. The Sponsor Academy, which was set up under the previous government, where you have a sponsor who um, sets up a trust and actually appoints the majority of the governors to the governing body, and that is a school which is expected to improve rapidly under that sponsor's guidance. The Converter Academies, which have just been going for about a year now, um, <laughs> generally the single ones, the governing body of the outgoing school appoints the academy trustees who then appoint the governing body of the new school. Very often the trustees and the governors are the same people, um, but it's a, a, a point of, that there is a legal difference between being a trustee and being a governor, and um, we are very keen that people understand that. Then we move to the fun bit, which is the multi-academy model. Basically, at the moment, we're looking at three sorts of multi-academy model. The first one is where there is a funding agreement with the Secretary of State, and each academy within the trust is subject to a supplementary agreement to the main agreement. And that academy trust has a board of directors who may decide to appoint local governing bodies or advisory bodies to each academy and to determine what delegated powers they have. And, of course, the most important power is the appointment of the principal. And so that would be, the, in that model, the actual overarching uh, trust would appoint the principal and not the governing body. Then we have the umbrella trust model where you have a separate, a separate charity trust which sits above the academy trust and each academy within the umbrella trust has its own funding agreement and its own academy trust. 
And then we have collaborative multi-academies, where they're all standalone, but they have partnership agreements, which they're supposed to, um, they're supposed to keep to within that, that partnership agreement arrangement. So get your heads around that. But whatever model you have, there will be a governing body. And the National Governors Association sort of mantra is that the business of governance is the same wherever you are. And what we are concerned about that at, at, the, at this point of making this decision making, it's a really good opportunity to review your governance arrangements and to look at these key things which make, as we understand it, good, um, good governance. And so when you're looking at articles of association and what you're going to uh, make as your new governing body and what you're going to delegate, uh, we, we would ask that all the people involved think about whether they have a common understanding of the roles and responsibilities of the governing body. And that training should be the norm for governors, but also for school leaders, because there is a, sometimes a gap between the understanding of what the governing body's role is and what the school leader thinks the governing body's role is. Um, there is a, almost an expectation that academy governing bodies will uh, work on a business model rather than a stakeholder model. Uh, we don't think that, the, that, that they, are, they are necessarily different things. There are enough ways of getting people with skills onto your governing body and fulfilling your stakeholder um, ethos as well. It's important that you have the right structure and a scheme of delegation. Um, there's no evidence that the governing body, the size of the governing body, is related to its effectiveness. However, it is ridiculous to have a governing body which is constantly carrying vacancies. And if you've got um, a host of committees where business is being repeated, this is an, an ideal opportunity to sort that out. Good chairing and good clerking is critical. Too many governing bodies don't have good clerks. Um, and the relationship between the school leaders and the governors should be based on trust and respect. And what we say is adopt a code of practice early on and make sure everybody understands it, including staff governors, and that is signed every year. Start off on a good basis, and it prevents problems happening further along the line. There are some, some research being published this um, very recently about, uh, about governance in sponsor academies, which been around for a while, so we sort of think maybe um, the research should be sound, sharp scrutiny, scrutiny of performance in the predecessor schools, but then that would be the case because that's why they were sponsor academies. Um, but interestingly, that under the direction of the sponsor, governors paid a key role in both setting and communicating a new vision and ethos for the school, which is you know, how many governing bodies actually revisit the vision and ethos frequently enough. Finally then, if you are considering converting, these are just things that we would say the governing body should consider. First of all, that they have access to quality, impartial information, advice and guidance. But we would say that because we provide some of it. Um, we think that actually consultation does matter. And that in my town, one school has gone off uh, to be an academy, it didn't even consult its feeder schools. It has upset the town terribly, and it would have been all the other schools in the town. You know, completely understand why it's doing it, but just to get that little thing wrong just has really set relationships and collaborative working backwards. Um, considering the long term as well as the short term, again referencing what we heard earlier about the, the funding offer, which is moving the whole time. Um, Access, um, assess practical implications such as the need to uh, increase your back office function and if you're not going to get services from the local authority where you're going to get them from, uh, reviewing your model of governance and uh, skills gaps training development and then act only in the interests of the children of the whole community and as I say, I said uh, with number one, if you if you get if you're an NGA member, you could access our Q and A, which has been updated as of the beginning of September, so it takes into account the, the ever moving goalposts and is written entirely from the government's point of view. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much, and um, look forward to the Q and A.